All right, so today I'm going to talk about starting your research, beginning the research process. I am going to try and keep it fairly short. I mentioned in the previous video, I want to, uh, so that I can keep your attention, I want to keep it under 10 minutes as, as best I can. So that's what I'm aiming for. Uh, hopefully that won't make it rushed, but we shall see. All right, so some foundational topics to, to think about. Um, is the concept of information literacy. That's kind of the overarching concept for this class. And essentially, if you're information literate, you know how to find the information that you need, how to evaluate it, all that good stuff. So the steps are uh, determining the information needs. So what is it exactly that I need? Do I need scholarly journal articles? Do I need newspaper articles? Do I need to read a book? Do I need some statistics? So on and so forth. Uh, once you know what you need, you got to go out and find it, finding and access, accessing that information. That is the bulk of what this course is about, finding the information that you need, uh, which databases to look in, how to effectively search. Most of this course focuses on this find and access step. Once you find it, you have to evaluate it. You know, is this good information or is it uh, uh, worthless? Then you incorporate that information into your knowledge base, and then finally you use it effectively. So in an academic setting, using it effectively would be writing a paper, right? Lastly, um, understand the legal and ethical impl implications. That means, again, in an academic setting, that you would um, not plagiarize, essentially. Uh, in a professional setting, it would be uh, you wouldn't steal someone else's work and use it for profit, something like that. And you know, there are other aspects to, to this step as well. So the aim of the game is for you to become information literate, literate from this class. So let's talk about uh, uh, types of research. There are a lot of different types, but I'm going to um, talk about uh, one dichotomy here. And that is between what we think of as original research, where you conduct experiments, you, uh, you know, survey populations, you're collecting original data, that sort of thing. Uh, we don't do that in this class, so this is not introduction to uh, original academic research. Instead, we're focusing on library and information research. So we might go out and find someone's original research, um, but we're not going to be conducting experiments or you know trying to capture squirrels out on campus or something like that. Uh, instead, we are focused on finding other people's research. Um, you know, those different steps of information literacy, evaluating it, incorporating into our knowledge base, stuff like that. Now, most research, so a research paper in many cases, uh, combines both of those, right? You would conduct an experiment on, say, you know, squirrel feeding habits, um, but you would also look at the previous literature on the subject and say, well, you know, Smith said that uh, squirrels preferred small acorns, and in a later study, so and so said that uh, actually it was larger. You know things like that. Um, you would look at other people's the previous work that was done, and um, combine it with your original research as well. So what they call a literature review um, in academic speak. Uh, so it's good to, to to know the distinction there between different types of research. Uh, one thing that I find among students and even um, uh, even among faculty members is this um, idea that they, they think they know how to research better than they actually do. And a good way to illustrate this is, is via the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, Dunning and Kruger were two psychologists, I, I think at Stanford, I can't remember, um, who found this effect that basically said that uh, the less you know on a topic, um, the better that you think you are at it. I think a good analogy is you probably know someone who thinks that they can dance really well uh, and they get out there and they just shake it on the dance floor when truth be told is they look awful. You know, they, they, they're they just an uncoordinated mess. Uh, those are people are entertaining, uh, but what happens is they aren't able to recognize good dancing. Uh, that is, they're in the lowest percentile or quartile of, of, of dance ability. And because of that, they can't, um, since they can't identify what good dancing is, um, then they think they're good dancers, that sort of thing. Uh, the same thing happens with research, I think, with information literacy, is that people think that they're, uh, uh, um, you know, they're basically inc incompetent, and they have 
you know, like inflated perceptions of their ability. They think they're better than they are. And for research, this results in poor research skills. So I would say that most people, when they conduct uh, what they think of as, as good research is they go to Google, they type in a few search terms, they examine maybe the first, probably just the first page of results. They pick a few websites, uh, they read through them, uh, they pick the ones that they think are best, and then they're done. Well, in truth, that is probably the lowest quartile of actual research ability. Um, there's much more to it, uh, to good research. So they're suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect there. Um, so let's go to back to beginning the research process. The first thing that you're going to do is um, come up with a topic, right? And then from that topic, you're going to create a research question. A research question is the central question uh, that you're posing in your research. And then once you've answered that question, and sometimes there are sub questions beneath it, but once you've answered that question, that answer becomes your thesis, your argument that you're trying to make. So the first thing is, you know, you have a topic, say elephant behavior. That's a pretty broad topic, but sure. You then must create a research question about that topic, some question that you have about, in this case, elephant behavior. And then when you answer it, it leads to your thesis or argument. So you might say, how do captive elephants behave differently from wild elephants? It's st still a pretty broad one. Um, but that's a question about elephant behavior. And then once you answer it, maybe they don't uh, behave differently at all. Maybe they, um, maybe they do, who knows? But you, know, you, you ask that question. Or maybe you say, what truth is there to the proposition that elephants have extensive memories? So again, that's kind of a, a popular myth, or maybe it's not a myth, I don't know, but you might examine that to see if, you know, is there any truth in the scientific literature about what, uh, elephants having, you know, long memories. Uh, so let's look at some examples of ineffective versus effective research. Well, first, let's, let's talk about what makes an ineffective or effective research question. Uh, one thing is vagueness versus specificity. So if you just say, if you have a word like children in your research question, well, children can mean a lot of things. It can mean anything from infants all the way up through teenagers, right? So you probably need to be more specific there. Uh, and then there is subjectivity versus objectivity. So if you have something like, uh, you know, sports are fun or why are sports so fun? And that's your research question. Well, fun is very subjective, right? If instead you turn that into an ob objective metric that you can actually measure, so sports cause people to um, have high levels of oxytocin, which is you know a, a, a chemical that is produced when you're you know happy and stuff like that, uh, then you could actually measure that. You could actually look into that. Uh, it's much more difficult to measure something that is subjective. So instead, you have to translate it into objective language. Uh, some examples of effective and ineffective research questions. So let's just look at a few here. Uh, should old people allowed, be allowed to drive? That is ineffective. Old is very subjective, right? Um, what effect does divorce have on academic achievement in elementary school children? That's, that's pretty effective. It's specific. Uh, it doesn't say something like what negative effect does divorce have. As soon as you insert something, a word like that, uh, like negative or positive, then you're already biasing yourself in one direction or the other. And you want to avoid biased language in your research question because then you'll come up with a, with a, uh, a biased thesis, right? Um, so it's pretty specific. It talks about, you know, it, it says academic achievement. Um, you could maybe be more specific there. You could say something like mathematical ability or something to that effect. Uh, it doesn't just say children. It says elementary school children. So again, pretty specific. Uh, who was Benjamin Franklin? This is highly ineffective. We know who Benjamin Franklin is. There are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of literal full-length biographies written about Benjamin Franklin. Uh, so this is much too broad. Uh, and then the last one, does the U.S. have a good foreign policy? Again, this is an ineffective research question. Uh, there are, you know, I don't know, 200 different nation states in the world. The U.S. has a different foreign policy for each and every one of those. Um, and then furthermore, it has specific types of foreign policy, you know, an economic policy, a military policy, a cultural policy, etc. So this is very, very broad. And a word like good, again, is we a, a, a weasel word, I suppose, um, meaning that, you know, it in, inserts bias there. It's subjective language. Uh, okay, let's move on to um, the information production cycle. Okay, I can already see that this is going to be a bit longer than 10 minutes, but maybe five more minutes and we'll be done. 
so the information production cycle, this is basically, uh, depending on how new something is, a concept, an event, um, it's going to determine what type of information you can actually find out about that uh, event or concept. Uh, so if we can imagine a, you know, a giant mutant lizard attacking downtown Tokyo, no relation to Godzilla here, where and what will you hear about it, right? Well, within minutes, you're going to hear um, news, probably on the on the internet nowadays. You you might even get an alert on your on your phone, like an emergency alert. Uh, you might hear something on Twitter. You might uh, hear something on the radio. Uh, in any case, it's going to be news at that point. And when it's news, it's very new. We don't know much about it. Uh, we don't know why the lizard is doing this. We don't know um, where it came from, where it falls in the you know. Um, tree of life, as it were, the, you know, scientific, um, taxonomy. Um, we, we just don't know much about it. Uh, same thing after a few hours, days, etc. the event has unfolded. Maybe it's actually returned to its lair in the ocean or whatever the case may be. Uh, but we still don't know much about it. Um, from a, I guess, an academic standpoint, a scientific standpoint, you might have experts weighing in on it, telling you, well, we think it's, uh, you know, it came out because it uh, had just hatched or something like that, or we, we found fragments of a shell, or who knows what they might say. Um, eventually, though, your people, maybe they took blood samples of it. Uh, they're doing actual uh, scientific analysis of it. They publish journal articles, again, after months, years even, that say, well, we've determined via DNA that, you know, this is the actual taxonomy, and here is the scientific name that we've given to it. Uh, after years, you might see entire books published on its, you know, the psychological impact on the Japanese population, the economic impact of the devastation that it wreaked on downtown Tokyo, stuff like that. Uh, but these things take time, right? Uh, the example I often give is uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit more than a decade now. I worked at the University of Memphis, and uh, it was at the beginning of the fall semester, and a lot of students wanted to um, write about uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina. Well, there were no books. There were no scholarly journals published at that point. Uh, it was it was mostly news. So um, those things simply didn't exist, and so they had to be creative about the sources that they found. So you have to understand, depending on where you are in the information cycle, uh, there may not be certain types of information available. Um, so where would you look for different types of, of information? Um, a newspaper article is going to give you facts and details about when, when it actually happened. So there will be on the ground uh, information, as it were, quotes from people who were actually there. Again, if we think of, for instance, 9-11 here, um, they didn't know necessarily the motivations, uh, who had actually uh, uh, done this terrorist attack. Um, but there were people that, you know, newspaper articles from the time are um, detailed what is happening on the ground, as it were. Uh, a scholarly journal article is going to have a more rigorous analysis uh, of what has uh, actually happened. So for 9-11, there may be, someone might look at, from a scholarly viewpoint, um, the effect that it's had on um, U.S. Uh, immigration, for instance. That's a good example. Uh, and they might have a scholarly analysis of that. A book is going to give much more in-depth information. It may look at it from a lot of different points of view, kind of like the uh, economic, psychological, cultural impact, things like that. Uh, it's going to be much more in-depth. A scholarly journal is going to be much more focused. Encyclopedia article um, definitely is typically is going to give you the information that is understood to be true about that event or that concept. Um, so the definition, the overview, key people involved, stuff like that. And then, of course, social media um, is mostly just opinions. Some, some people's opinions are, are perhaps given more weight than others, but uh, that's mostly what it is, not necessarily fact. Uh, and we've seen what kind of trouble that can cause in um, recent months and years. Okay, uh, just real quickly, primary versus secondary sources. Basically, a primary source, these can mean different things in different fields of study, but essentially a primary source is some, uh, straight from the horse's mouth, so it's, it has no layer of analysis over it. Uh, a secondary source, however, will analyze or interpret primary sources or even other secondary sources, so it, ha it somehow analyzes it. Uh, I'm not going to run through all of these. I'll just mention the first few here. Oh, let me go back. I bet. Uh, film footage of a presidential speech, that would be a primary source, okay, because it's simply the speech, okay. Now, if there was commentary, 
uh, during the speech, you know, from pundits, political pundits, that commentary would, um, you know, maybe be a secondary, would be a secondary source, you know, analyzing the, the speech itself. A diary entry from a Holocaust survivor, again, that's a, a primary source. Results of a laboratory experiment, a primary source. A biography of Kanye West would be a secondary source, right? An autobiography would be a primary source. Um, so anytime there's a layer of anal analysis, it's going to be a secondary source. All right, just real quick, uh, I want to mention, uh, so we've got here Google and, we've, and someone has typed in, where can I find journal articles on world history? Uh, so this is a highly ineffective search. What all is wrong with it? Well, there's several things. First off, it, it uses natural language. So uh, it's got a lot of needless words in there. A better search would simply be something like journal articles, world history. Even that, though, isn't necessarily a, a very good search. For one, uh, world history, right? That's an incredibly broad topic. Are we talking about, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, four billion years of, of history of the Earth? Are we talking about uh, about fourteen thousand some odd years of recorded human history? Um, you know, what are we talking about here? It's super broad. Um, another thing that is potentially wrong with this is the focus on journal articles. A lot of times you're not you're unnecessarily or unduly restricting yourself to a certain type of source when in truth uh, you could use any number of types of sources so for instance in the field of history yes there are lots of journal articles published but a lot of the major breakthroughs and a lot of the uh, uh, prominent works I should say are books are published in book format so there's more um, credence not credence but uh, value or, or prop um, prestige, whatever you might want to call it, lended to uh, publishing in books in history than there are in some other di disciplines. In the sciences, uh, typically um, publishing in the journal literature is, is, uh, is the primary way to communicate new, new discoveries and stuff like that. And then the last thing here is that they're searching in Google, right? So there's at least four things wrong here. The natural language is much too broad. Uh, limiting to a particular type of source when that may not be wrong, and then looking in the wrong place, right? If you, if the, if you really were looking for journal articles, you probably wouldn't want to look in, in Google, and we'll talk about that more at a later time. Okay, I think that'll do it for now. Um, you can look at these slides here. Uh, I'm not going to go over those. I've already almost hit 20 minutes. I've broken my promise. Uh, hopefully you've stuck with me. 17 minutes I'm at now, almost 18. That still seems like a uh, not nearly as long as a regular class. So hopefully I've kept your attention. Um, there will be one more um, lecture to listen to for this week, uh, a couple things to do. Uh, so make sure you stay on top of things and get everything uh, watched, read, listened to by Sunday so that you can turn everything in by 11.59 p.m. Okie doke.